Hello, my gentle and of course very modern apes. My name is Erica. I am a fourth year PhD candidate in biological anthropology and I am a science communicator here on YouTube. Today, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the war on science. Normally what I do here is I debunk pseudoscience or I talk about the latest cool finds in paleoanthropology or primatology or evolutionary biology generally or some other such cool discoveries, uh, but I can't do that today. I have a much larger responsibility right now. It's tough to know where to begin with all of this stuff, so I will start as bluntly as I possibly can. Science, big S science, like the enterprise of human understanding, uh, is under attack here in the United States. Right now I'm writing a pretty big script on the history of evolutionary theory and creationism, both in the United States and abroad, so obviously that involves a lot of reading about legislature and court battles and proposed bills and funding going to and then being pulled from science or the NSF or specific projects like the space race here in the US. And it's with that knowledge that I say, I think that what we're looking at right now is unprecedented. There is nothing to compare it to. We have never seen anything like what we're living through right now with regard to attacks on big S science. Why am I specifying big S science here? The reason is because it's all of it. All of science is being affected. Like I said, I've been doing a script on the history of you know, the evolution and creation controversies here in the US, so we've seen fluctuations in certain branches of science before. Funding has been given to research on evolutionary biology and then taken away. Funding has been given to organizations like NASA for the space race and then it's been reduced after we landed on the moon. That kind of stuff is, relatively speaking, normal. But what we're seeing right now, well, like I said, I think it's unprecedented. I don't think anything like this has ever happened happened in the history of this country or in the history of any Western nation. But okay, maybe all of that just sounds like standard fear-mongering you might hear from legacy media. What is actually happening? Historically speaking, the United States is the biggest producer of scientific research in the entire world. We'll come back to that historically speaking later, but as of 2020, my country was absolutely killing it when it came to scientific publications. America was leading the world when it came to research and doing it with just a tiny percent of the budget. Well, let's back it up just a little bit. Research generally comes in two flavors. The first is basic research, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's researching basic concepts in various different fields. And the second is applied research, which is taking basic research and applying it, turning it into some kind of product or medication or weapon. Not all basic research eventually becomes applied research and results in some kind of wonderful innovation, but all wonderful innovations are preceded by basic research. Classic examples include decades of research on E. coli resulting in CRISPR-Cas gene editing technology or research on Gia monster venom, which is a type of lizard resulting in Ozempic. For obvious reasons, then, most basic research is not done by private companies because it's rarely immediately financially viable. Now, mind you, that does not stop them from swooping in and using basic research that's been carried out by public institutions to innovate in their own way and then make money off of those innovations, but they don't perform that basic research themselves. That's your government. Around 50% of all basic research in the United States, again, historically the biggest producer of basic research and scientific research generally in the entire world, comes from governmental agencies like NASA, NOAA, and the EPA. The next approximately 45% also comes from the government, but in a slightly different way. It comes from the government's funding of academia. Private companies account for the remaining few percents or portions of percents. So to sum it up so far, nearly all of the basic research that comes out of the United States, remember basic research necessarily precedes applied or experimental research, comes from government-funded projects. And these projects produced a lot of products that we use in our everyday life that you might have heard of, including things like GPS, Doppler radar, MRI technology, countless medications, including vaccines, 
microchips, the internet. Now, many of these innovations came from specific government agencies, right? Research in NASA is what led to getting humans on the moon, for example. But a whole lot of things that we enjoy come from academia. So how does the government fund academia and how much does it cost? Perhaps unsurprisingly, the majority of the biomedical research that comes from the United States comes from the academia portion, specifically being funded by the NIH, or National Institute of Health. Virtually the rest of academic research that isn't biomedical falls under the purview of the NSF, or the National Science Foundation. Scientists, research groups, or universities can apply to the NSF or the NIH with a grant proposal. This is basically them saying, here's my project idea, here's why it's worth funding, and here's how much I'm asking for. And then these organizations will hold committee hearings to see which projects they're going to fund and which projects should perhaps reapply. And not every project is the same. You would apply for a different type of grant if you were a graduate student than you would if you were post postdoctoral or early career or mid-career or late career or whatever, there are different types of grants that you apply for given the stipulations of the project and where you're at in your academic journey. And they obviously do not grant everything. In fact, usually there's a set amount of grants with the allocated funds within a specific grant category and you're competing with everybody else who's applying for that same grant. It's extremely competitive. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this is why we get such amazing science out of the NIH and the NSF, because it's so competitive. Even the grants that you submit have to effectively have proof of concept before they'll even consider funding you. So you might be thinking, wow, that's amazing. Just how much money do we pump into this wonderful system? Given the sheer magnitude of the United States' contributions to basic research at a global scale and how much of a role academia plays in getting that research out there, surely, you must be thinking, it's a lot. Surely we're putting a lot of money into academia. Well, the United States budget for 2024 was $6.5 trillion, and of that money, approximately $9 billion went to the NSF, and $48 billion went to the NIH, which means that academia gets about $57 billion of the $6.75 trillion. That's less than 1%. Less than 1% of the United States' yearly budget goes towards academic research, and yet we still dominate when it comes to producing basic research on a global scale and producing applied or experimental research on a global scale. That sounds pretty damn efficient to me. Personally, I'm not sure why you would want to mess with that system unless it was cutting the minute amounts of bloat within and then reallocating those funds back into research. Now, when you apply for a grant at the NIH or the NSF, you include something called indirect costs. And this is going to be important later, so I'm just going to go ahead and explain it now. Indirect costs are a sort of tax on the research that you do, and it goes to the university for upkeep purposes. It's the reason why researchers who work at a university don't have to pay rent at a lab. The university takes a portion of every grant and puts it towards maintaining the university for everything from keeping the lights on in a literal sense to providing spaces with internet or repairing things like fume hoods or maintaining power to refrigerated specimen storage. By taking a portion of this grant money, schools can afford to keep tuition lower. They used to get this money from the state, but we've seen tack downs as the decades have worn on and on, which means universities have had to get it from other places, and the infrastructure of research as a whole has now been built on this foundation. Now, most state schools, like the one that I go to, have an indirect cost of about 50%. For private companies, the amount that that company takes out of a grant is usually significantly lower because that company is planning on making money off of whatever product it is you create. They have other immense, gargantuan sources of revenue, so they can afford to keep that indirect cost low. Universities do not. 
And this system, of course, reinforces the dichotomy where public funded projects generally produce basic research because they can, because they are not beholden to financial expectations versus private companies mostly producing applied research built on the back of the basic research because they expect financial returns. Now, all of that being said, government funded research as a whole is imperfect. Of course it is. Bloat, corruption, inequity, these things plague pretty much every human system, and I don't doubt that they are also at play in academia and government-funded research in general. But results speak for themselves, and we're doing pretty dang good so far. It is a beautiful but splotchy stained glass window. So let's talk about the brick that was thrown through it. Uh, who threw the brick and why they threw it. After Donald Trump took office on the 20th of January, a flurry of executive orders came down the pipeline that had immediate impacts on science as a whole. Science, big S science, is our way of understanding the natural world around us, so I do consider it an impact and, in fact, an assault on science as a whole when an organization or even singular person is attacking the bedrock of how we do science here in the United States. The executive order that pulled us from the Paris Climate Change Accord, the executive order that terminated our relationship with the World Health Organization, and the executive order that declared there are only two sexes and sex is determined at conception were all three poor signs of what was to come. But on January 27th, one week in, all federal grants were frozen. It didn't matter if you were a graduate student or a researcher of 40 years. If you had a federal grant, you couldn't access those funds. It didn't matter if you were researching river fluctuations in South America or if you were researching cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, or any other deadly disease. Why did they do this? Officially, they did it because they wanted to make sure that all the federal grants aligned with the motivations of the executive branch. This was wrong and illegal for a great many reasons, not the least of which that these grants were by and large not awarded in the past seven days. And so they shouldn't be under the jurisdiction of a new administration when they were awarded under the old one. It's for this reason and many others that a federal judge blocked the order. But for many people, it didn't matter that a federal judge blocked it. The funds remain frozen. And this is due to two primary reasons. One, administrative loopholes, for example, canceling committees that are in charge of releasing funds instead of just pausing the funds themselves. Only the latter was prevented by a judge, and for two, the NSF and the NIH are petrified of doing something wrong under unclear orders, and so they remain stymied. For instance, let's say you're in charge of releasing money to a project that's working on the effects of climate change. What are you going to do under the current extremely litigious administration when Trump says do one thing, a federal judge says do another, and the Trump administration doubles down and says do not award the money? I know some people who can access their grant money, and I know others who can't, and there's seemingly no rhyme or reason to it because amidst all of this, the NIH and NSF are also experiencing enormous cuts to their staff. So it's basically just a cluster. The real gut punch to American research came on February 7th when Trump's team announced that there was going to be a cap on the indirect costs that a university could effectively have as their policy, a maximum of 15%. At my university, that would be a drop of 35%. And my university is on the lower end of indirect cost percentages. Here's the twist. Universities get around 40% of their income from these indirect costs. Meaning if this goes through, universities are either going under, they will cease to exist as a system here in the United States, or tuition costs are going to rise dramatically to compensate. This policy is also currently on hold because virtually every state decided to sue the pants off of the administration for it because it would mean the death of their university and the death of the communities which surround them. 
The freeze plus the funding caps have already led to immeasurable impacts in research and direct impacts to the way that universities operate. The University of Iowa has halted the hiring of all new graduate research assistants unless they're already funded as a direct cost on an established project. Likewise, Stanford University has announced a freeze on staff hiring due to the plans on cutting funding for scientific research of all sorts. And they're not the only one. Some undergraduates who were already accepted into PhD programs have had their offers rescinded due to fears of the university's inability to fund them following cuts. Other universities have reportedly reduced the amount of graduate students they are currently accepting by up to 75%. That is the beginning of the collapse of the university system and our ability as a nation to train new scientists from undergraduates up to practicing, publishing, bona fide researchers. Staff cuts at the NIH and NSF have not only reduced the number of senior researchers actually reviewing grants and running these organizations, but have led to massive delays in the next cycle of grant approval. The headlines regarding academia and academic research are dire and they are endless. The stated goal with this attack on academia is to reduce bloat in the system. I don't buy that for a second. I think the long-term goal here is to privatize research. What a fabulous idea. If you want to slow down progress by an order of magnitude because no private company will fund the types of basic research that set the stage for enormous future innovations. But this is actually a war on science, not just academia, so we have to touch on some more stuff. There are now trigger words that will get your research or grant proposal flagged if it doesn't align with the glass bones and paper skin ideology of the current administration. Good luck researching the physiological differences in the response to certain medications in men versus women, I guess. Purges to the CDC staff and database has left infectious disease researchers scrambling and public health in danger. Totally fine. As long as another pandemic doesn't happen, or diseases don't behave as they traditionally have for the past 3.8 billion years. And I'm sure putting RFK in charge of public health will definitely not exacerbate the problem and certainly doesn't belie an enormous 180 in terms of public health in the United States. If you are disabled, a minority, a woman, or poor, your health care doesn't matter. And if you're trans, it's actively being demonized. Our environment in the future due to climate change and in the present due to the gutting of environmental protections is in immense peril. The immediate halting of USA to other nations has already sealed the fate of hundreds of thousands of babies who are doomed to be born with HIV. And millions more still will die of malaria and tuberculosis abroad and of measles or polio at home. This is a catastrophic, full assault on science that won't just remove the United States from being number one or close to number one when it comes to producing scientific research on the global scale, but will punt it straight back into the dark ages, in addition to cutting thousands, if not tens of thousands, of American jobs, all while killing millions by denying them preventatives and medication and accelerating the burning of the planet. I've been saying this whole time that the United States has historically been the number one producer of research, and that's for a reason, because we've been surpassed by China, and China will happily continue to bear that torch. I've heard they're already stepping up in USAID's stead as well. There are millions of people in this country that want the United States to stay a leader in science, to protect and advocate for science. And if you're one of those people, then you need to get your butt to one of the nationwide Stand Up For Science rallies this Friday on March 7th. The sacrifice of science on the altar of oligarchy is happening right now, and we need to do absolutely everything we can to stop it. I'll be there on Friday. Where will you be?